Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to call the meeting to order. I'm Michael Burns, current vice chair of this esteemed body, and um, we'll handle the roll call first. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Members present today include Nate Anderson, Michael Burns, Violet Delkey, Zach Hiring, Pat Kovash, Jeff Schauman, Bobby Soline, and Deb White. Thank you. Are there, uh, moving on, are there any agenda amendments? None at this time for us. Thank you. Hearing no other response, uh, we'll proceed to approval of the minutes. I move to approve the minutes from March 4th. Second. Any discussion regarding the motion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Next item, any citizens care to address the board? All right, thank you. Uh, now we'll proceed to the election of the officers. And I guess we start by opening the nominations, correct? Yep, we'll need a uh, chair. Um, Michael is acting as, as the current vice chair and then uh, secretary as well. So those are the appointments that we'd be seeking today. Right. Let's, uh, let's begin by uh, nominations for the chair position. I would move that Michael Burns become the chair, that our vice chair become the chair. I'll second that. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Uh, nominations for the vice chair. I would nominate Nate Anderson. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Uh, nominations for secretary. Uh, I would make a motion that Violet Delkey become our secretary. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you and congratulations for those willing to, to step up in those positions. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Such a big honor. <laughs> Uh, proceeding to the commissioner's reports. Yes. I would just like to um, talk about an event that we have happening here in Moorhead tomorrow. The Clay County Jail Ministry is doing their annual spring event. So um, we're going to have um, testimony of how the ministry is changing lives turning lives around and helping people get back on their feet, either after they've been um, through an addiction and rehabilitation or coming out of jail or prison. It's going to be an awesome evening. I'll pass these flyers around so you can see. It's, um, you know, it, it's our spring silent auction and fundraiser, but um, it's going to tell a great story. And so I invite you to come. Thank you. Any other? Yes, Pat. <clears throat> Got a brief MBA update here. Um, we held our diversity job fair, <clears throat> excuse me, last Tuesday at the Moorhead Center Mall. We had 33 businesses that participated. <coughs> I mean, what a turnout. It just shows the need for, for employees and, and bodies. And it was, a, it was just a great response from the businesses and the job seekers. And we're, we are planning on holding another one this winter. Our NBA golf tournament is May 23rd at the Meadows Golf Course. It's open to the public. Uh, we have about 11 teams registered right now. 
We have uh, hole-in-one sponsors for uh, a new pontoon and a $5,000. So, I mean, if you can swing a club, it's worth a shot. And uh, um, more, our Moorhead Proud uh, Ooze and Oz 4th of July celebration. Um, this year we're having food trucks. It's going to be from 6 to 9, so the event's going to be a little bit longer and the band's going to uh, play earlier. So that should be a great opportunity to get your family out. That is really, it, it's one of the things that identifies Moorhead and, and that we all need to come together on. And, and, and it's an FM area thing, but, but it, it, it's a great thing for Moorhead to have that. And it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a privilege for the MBA to be able to put it on. We really enjoy that. So. And our, and our Let's Talk business meeting this Wednesday morning at the Frying Pan at uh, 7 a.m., Megan Kruger uh, will be our speaker from the uh, Moorhead Public Library. So if you want to have breakfast, come on out at 7, and we can all listen to Megan. Thank you. Any others? Yes, John. Just maybe give a quick update as far as um, the water towers. And maybe Chris, you can join if I miss something here. but. Just an update here that uh, the utility is building a new water tower in South Moorhead. And there has been a committee similar to the previous two art designs that uh, have decided how that's going to be. I guess there's two options that are up for vote right now, and that will be done tomorrow night at the Board uh, Public Service meeting. But the biggest one would be the Interstate 94 water tower. Uh, there's been significant discussion going on of how we should address that as far as a centerpiece for the city as far as entering. So there is a, a, a fairly significant group representing all areas of interest to put a, a unique design to that uh, tower and that's still in process here for it. So those would be a couple of, um, I think, significant type of uh, promotions that the utility and the city is, are going to be working on together. Is there a projected date when that water tower construction will start? The bids are going out, so hopefully completion would be done in 2020. So that tower will be up and running while we take down the interstate one to get it surfaced. Because every 20 years they have to be repainted and serviced. So that's three hundred dollars to $400,000 you know, here or there, uh, so it's a significant process. But again, since that work is going to be done, it was thought that would be a good opportunity to do something unique for the city and the utility together. Did, did I miss the location of where it's going to be? These, I, well, I don't have the address here, but it's 50th, something in that order, south? I can't remember. South of 40th. South of 4th, yes. <laughs> And it's over by the soccer complex that area. I, awesome. I sat on the committee with the water tower because it's fourth okay. ward, so. Awesome. It's going to be a great design. Kind of highlight everything in Moorhead and South Moorhead, so. Awesome. Thank you. And then. How about the, inter the proposed interstate? That is still being worked on by the group here. It's city staff is there and the utility, a public input is being put in, so that's still being worked on here in Moorhead. <clears throat> and there's a couple of commissioners working on that as well. But I think that's going to be more unique here. And there's, there's been grants submitted for to help the share of the cost and that sort of thing. So the group is working hard on putting that together. So thank, that would be a, thank be you. a good project here. And then the final one, just again for you, where there's bids being going to be submitted for the sludge plant. I don't know if everybody has heard about that or familiar with that. Uh, EDA has said that we can't continue with our holding ponds, so we have to put a plant together to compress the sludge and then take it out to landfill. So that is another significant project that's coming up for the utility. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, I have one. Yes. I, and actually, I might call on Dan or Chris to give a few more details about this, but we had another really successful Red River Market here over the weekend in the Moorhead Center Mall. And I know when they were here a few months ago, we were at the Yemcoms, and there wasn't enough capacity for the number of people. We were at the Moorhead Center Mall this weekend. Huge turnout, and I think just in very pertinent considering the, you know, when we talk about the downtown plan, um, of the kind of things that people are looking to come to in downtown Moorhead. So I don't know if you have numbers on that, Dan. 
I'd, I'd love to. I'm sorry I don't have numbers, but there was a ton of energy. I mean, so uh, uh, happening around this downtown. Um, you know, we did test out the winter Red River Market um, at the Yemkomst uh, about a little over a month ago, and there was a little more capacity than it could handle, and they wanted to try another one. So we, we, we were in the, in the mall this last weekend, and it was fantastic. It felt great. A lot of it, it, it. I'll be totally honest. It felt like a lot of folks really breaking out of cabin fever, yeah. <laughs> and so. But it was wonderful to see the parking ramp at capacity and the parking lots full and people walking around and creating great memories and experiences in downtown. Um, and this would have been the second very strong Saturday morning, frankly, in the afternoon. Um, the St. Patrick's Parade and Run um, was at the first weekend in March as well. So. Uh, you know, I just would really love to see the credit card receipts <laughs> for this month. It's been great downtown. So, and I can tell you from other communities that that's something that a lot of downtown mall areas have done is bring in a winter market. We see that in a lot of other cities of our size, where those winter markets, then um, having them there throughout the you know throughout the colder months, and then it helps to reinvigorate also the other stores, the <coughs> stores in those areas too. Yeah, I was just going to say. So downtown Moorhead Inc. We uh, we did sponsor. We did co-sponsor with. Uh, the Folkways group, they're a fantastic group. They do a lot of great things for the community. So um, as we kind of get later in the agenda, when, when we start talking about the downtown plan, they actually are a component, a, a group of that plan. So we hope that uh, this continues to build, this partnership. Certainly they've had a lot of focus and, and energy in downtown Fargo, but um, we're thankful that they're exploring Moorhead. And, and obviously, yeah, again, they have a great following and seeing a lot of people come to the mall and, and the UMCOM. So it's exciting things. We'll put a report together, hopefully have some information for the next meeting as far as summarizing what the activity looked like, numbers. Thank you all. Any further items? Mr. Chair, I just want to make sure we welcome Zach, obviously our newest member, and, and maybe just give an opportunity, Zach, just to introduce yourself to the group and who you're with, and um, just so we get to know you a little bit better, too. Yeah, thank you. So. Uh, I'm Zach Hiring. Um, my wife and I met at Concordia, so it's really awesome that now we're neighbors with Chuck, which is an even better bonus. But uh, we, we've now been full residents here for almost a year and loving every second of it. Um, so I have the State Farm off of 30th Avenue by the Safari Movie Theater. Um, and didn't know anything about this, and, and Chuck brought this opportunity to me and applied, and, and it's been really cool. I just really want to become ingrained in the community and help any way I can, so I appreciate being a part of it. Welcome. And I think we have a new city staff member. Yes, Go for that's it. Uh, Matt Odegaard, <laughs> Matthew Odegaard. He is uh, starting his second day of an internship. In, uh, we have an economic development intern at the city. We're bringing in the voices of, of younger folks. We have one going in sustainability, an intern in communications and economic development. We're thinking community development as well and perhaps some of the GIS and mapping and other opportunities. But Matthew started up. He's a student at um, MSUM and in the economics department. Really excited to have him on board. And um, yeah, we look forward to working with you. Welcome, Matt. Welcome. Thank you. Moving on to item number seven. Uh, it's a resolution for preliminary approval of the issuance of facility revenue bonds to uh, Eventide for administrative offices located at 801 Main Avenue. We'll give you the spot with the microphone, Jeff. Well, thanks for it. Hi, Jim. You want to inter introduce yourself? Hey, Mr. Chairman, members of the mission, my name is Jim Stewart. I'm an attorney with Arnson Stewart and Wagner in Fargo. We're here representing Eventide as bond counsel. Um, Eventide is requesting the EDA to issue bonds on their behalf to finance the acquisition of their administrative office building. It's on the corner of Main and 8th. That building is condominiumized, and so Eventide will be purchasing the second floor for their offices. Um, we have a proposed resolution for your consideration that would uh, give preliminary approval to the issuance of bonds and schedule a public hearing for your May 6th meeting. Uh, if you have any questions regarding the financing, I'd be happy to answer those. If you have questions regarding the project, Darren O, the CFO is here and can address those questions. Uh, as with the prior bonds that the EDA has issued for Eventide, the EDA acts as a conduit 
but you don't have any liability for any payments on the bonds. That when the deal is closed, the, your, your loan agreement is assigned to a bank, and uh, Eventide is solely responsible for all of the payments and just makes those payments directly to the bank. So there's no continuing involvement for the EDA. But, uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Apparently not. Thank you. Thank you. Is there action required on that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, is there a motion to approve uh, this request? I, I move for approval. I'll second. Yeah. Uh, okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried, thank you. All right, there's, now we have the legislative update, uh, Lisa. Yeah, and I just, before Lisa starts too, I just wanna uh, kind of give a refresher for those that weren't here, but we had uh, some conversation at the, the last CDA about uh, getting the legislative update. Um, I know there were some questions from some members of, you know, are there issues that uh, members should be aware of or uh, maybe some potential for the EDA to support on different things or take a position on certain things. So um, thank you, Lisa. I know she's been very busy with flood stuff and, and legislative work, so that's a daunting task for both <laughs> items. But um, we appreciate her taking the time just to go with them, through some of the things that are being worked on at the state level. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, the 2000. Uh, 19 legislative agenda we brought forward to the EDA at the end of 2018 that included the legislative priorities that uh, were approved by the City Council and the EDA's involvement um, is also um, paramount because the EDA is helping to is is funding the legislative contracts that the City of Moorhead has with Flaherty and Hood and with Fredrickson and Byron um, and it's a combination of staff work and these um, consultants that are in St. Paul all of the time. So um, Scott Hutchins has been serving as um, a mentor and legislative consultant to the city. So he and I have been working together on um, the, the city's legislative agenda this year. Um, as a reminder, our um, we have bonding initiatives and policy initiatives. The policy initiatives are related to the border cities uh, legislation and um, the bonding initiatives include the Clay County Transfer Station, support of that, of Clay County's efforts on the, on the transfer station, uh, support of the DNR's efforts to um, fund the remaining flood mitigation for the city of Moorhead, and um, MnDOT's efforts to um, secure funding for the 11th Street uh, rail crossing separation. So those are the bonding initiatives. At this point in the game, we don't know if there will be a bonding bill or not, but um, the uh, transfer station and the flood control projects have been introduced. There are bills, and you'll note the bill numbers are, are listed in the uh, dashboard that you have in your packet. And um, there have been hearings on each of those. As far as the 11th Street, project there has not been bills introduced at this point but it was highlighted by governor walls in his bonding proposal so we don't know whether there will be a bonding bill but um, we feel like we're in in pretty good positions on all of those projects because they're in flux in some fashion at you know at all of those levels and, and Lisa, I'll add too, so th with uh, the governor's budget as well and, and kind of making a priority on that one, there's just two projects from what I understand from the commissioner that came in. Um, I think the other one was in Duluth, if I'm blanking on it right, but there's two projects that he was basically putting towards um, kind of his priorities of whether it's safety or uh, access, et cetera. Transporta transportation uh, transportation yes. projects. The other one's in Anoka County. Gotcha. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. And, um, 
then on the policy initiatives, the border cities, our goal is some technical fixes that are really not significant, but they help to clarify the program. And the other is very significant, and that would be a sustainable appropriation for border cities. Um, we feel like we're in a very good position with that in the House, and um, we have also had hearings in the Senate, and I believe that it would be pure speculation for me to tell you exactly how that will work out, but we continue to work on that initiative. And what has been put in place is a million dollars a year, which 70% of that would be um, available to Moorhead. And so we're, we're very hopeful. The House is very excited about it, and the, the Senate has asked for a little more detail, which we continue to work on. So we're in a, a relatively good position on all of these matters. Um, and then there's, there's one more small note on uh, building codes that the Border City Building Codes Bill has been introduced this session. There has been little activity uh, on that bill. It was not submitted at our request. It was submitted by um, a senator and a House member that, um, that did that just of their own volition. Um, it, this, this obviously remains still an important objective for us, but it is, as I understand at this point, going to be a futures issue. It's not something that is making significant progress yet at this session. So I believe we're well positioned on all fronts. We're a little more than halfway through the session, but a lot happens in the last month or so of this session. So um, we, the agenda is set. The initial process is done in introducing those bills, and so I think we're into the stage where there is negotiation between the House and the Senate, and um, a little bit of politics comes into play. Thank you, Lisa. <clears throat> Any uh, questions or comments in regards to the uh, information that Lisa shared? Yes. So, Lisa, just to put people at ease, too, in terms of the bonding bill, right, there seemed to be interest in both the House and the Senate, and obviously with the governor to have one this year. And that's always, that's typically a late session. You know, they don't act on the bonding bill until pretty late in the session anyway. So there's nothing, you know. That is correct. And, and this is not traditionally a bonding year. So if there is a bonding bill, we're, we're well positioned on, on those projects, but it, it's yet to be determined. When the governor issued his priorities, it was before the most recent budget forecast. So there, there is a lot, lot unknown at this point. Hey, thank you. You have John. Last month there was a question if uh, the gas tax, there was a border city provision or not. Have we heard anything further? about having an exception to the gas tax proposal? There is an exception in current law. So it, 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 that would, there is a limitation on how much more we can be than North Dakota. So that, that has not changed. Yeah, John. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to re-emphasize the importance of the Clay County Transfer Station. We have one out there that's 40 years old, and we've been using Band-Aids for the last 10 years, and if you use too many Band-Aids, it's going to turn into one big scab. So um, just want to re-emphasize that we do need that transfer station, and I'm glad it is a top priority for the city of Moorhead. Thanks. Lisa, I just wanted to thank you for your work on this. I know, I know it's a lot of work, so thank you. I'm enjoying it quite a bit, so okay. thank you. Thank you. It's fun to learn something new. Yeah. All right, thank you all. Thank you. I assume that you're the next presenter, Derek. I am, yes. I'm gonna start it off, but it'll probably have a variety. I know um, um, we have some team members here from our, our, uh, our new project with the downtown master plan, so Peggy Harder. Uh, is in the audience and Brian Reinhardt's and there's a item being passed around right now just kind of a lay down this is um, what uh, the team had had given us as a lay down for our our interview process uh, for the downtown plan so you'll kind of see a, a little bit of a handout of who their their team is consisted of but uh, I just want to take it a step back and just kind of talk through the process because this has been kind of an ongoing conversation that we've had in the EDA for a little while 
Um, back in 2016, uh, well before I started even with Downtown Moorhead Inc. and before they had a, a staff, um, my board chair, Dave Anderson, who couldn't make it here today f because of a work conflict, um, and the acting chair at the time, Bob Booth, who was with Bell Bank, uh, came to the EDA and, and kind of talked about the importance of a downtown plan and really kind of setting a vision uh, moving forward, whether that's from you know development standpoints to our infrastructure to our transportation system. There's a lot of different uh, components uh, and, and policies and everything else that go into these, these plans. Um, at that point in time, uh, there was a, an ask to kind of um, try to get it started. The EDA at that point in time in 2016 uh, offered uh, $60,000 towards the plan. Uh, fast forward a couple years later when I started in the beginning of 2018, uh, we really started having hard conversations and, and, and really the, the necessary conversations of what this plan could look like and what the actual uh, dollar amount looks like to really kind of make make sure we get a plan that one is is effective um, and and comprehensive too. Um, so we had a lot of conversations with the city, a lot of conversations with my board, uh, some conversations with the EDA. Um, we obviously had some different things that came up as priorities when I first started, and one of them being how you know I became in the position I am right now with the contract with the city. Um, but now we feel like the time is is right. We've uh, have put out an RFQ, or we had an RFQ out, a request for qualifications. There was 13 submissions. Uh, which was just absolutely fantastic. I mean, it really showed the interest that we've gained, uh, not only locally but regionally, and, and even some national um, kind of uh, groups that came in and submitted to our planning process. Uh, and a lot of people did a lot of diligent work on that. I, I fielded phone calls from every single one of those 13 submissions. Uh, they really kind of showed an effort, and it really showed with their proposals that they submitted. Uh, we had a review team that consisted of um, kind of a mixed bag of, of different uh, hats. We had myself, my board chair, Dave Anderson, Michael Burns, who sits on uh, obviously this EDA board, but also on my, my DMI board. Uh, we had Marcia uh, Pluchinski, who is with Image Group Architects. She's on my board as well. Um, we had Ted Haran with RDO, who kind of runs their marketing uh, division. We had um, uh, Dan Molly from the city and Christy Leshevsky from the city. So we had some city uh, focus. And we really just wanted to um, bring together a team that had a lot of different opinions and, and wore a lot of different hats that could provide the most um, effective review, but also go through that uh, interview process with a critical eye. Uh, we shortlisted from the 13. We shortlisted five for interviews. We conducted those um, in the middle of March, and thankfully weather <laughs> held off for us. Uh, we actually did the interviews in Eventide's new corporate building, so it was fantastic to kind of be in their, their office setting in a, in a new downtown building. Uh, but the weather held off. We got through our interviews. We took a long time to kind of review those. Uh, when it was all said and done uh, through that review group, uh, out of the, the six people that were a part of that kind of interview phase, uh, five of them had the Stantec group that was selected as their number one choice. Uh, they really rose to the top. Uh, they, they put together a fantastic team. Um, and, and as I kind of build on this too, they, they certainly, Stantec is, is large enough, they're, they're a global company. Uh, they could have done everything internal, in-house, kind of did everything that way. What they really did and what really intrigued, I think, a lot of the review group, and Dan and, and Michael, feel free to add if, if you have any um, um, opinions on it. But uh, they really took a different approach by adding uh, a local development group, the Kilbourne group, um, who there's no secret, they've obviously been looking uh, in other cities, um, and if there, there's different projects that are up there. So having a group like that um, to be able to kind of get in front of and share ideas um, is certainly going to help our reputation from a development standpoint. Uh, they also have Land Elements, who is an architecture firm in town, to look at streetscape specifically, uh, as well as some other elements. Um, and then the Folkways group, which we mentioned earlier, that really is a kind of community building uh, group that really looks at data, looks at different events, uh, Urban placemaking is the term that they use, so they're really looking at, at areas that in most people's eyes would just look at as a, as a vacant kind of dead space, but they kind of look at it in the opposite lens of this is an opportunity, you know, this could be become something that's really unique. 
So again, a really uh, unique team build. Uh, one person that you'll see on the list is David Dixon. He's out of Stantex Urban Places Division. Um, he is like a Yoda in economic development and urban urban development kind of stuff. He's he's a premier. I mean, he's works in a lot of like big big cities. Uh, we're really thankful that he's going to be helping us through some of the challenges in the in the downtown Moorhead plan. So, um, really fantastic. He was a part of the interview. He had some unique data that we really hadn't thought of before. Uh, so, it really kind of looking at those assets and and how we move forward. So, with that being said, um, we've I've said it all along. My board has kind of said it as well. For us to get a plan that is successful, comprehensive. Um, and to cover a lot of the components that not only the city, but the EDA and others have wanted as additions to it, we really needed to look at that expanded uh, budget. The handout that, or the attachment that was in your EDA packet is the most up-to-date scope and budget for the plan. So it goes through uh, really a step-by-step -step process of the plan. And this is, I'm just raising up here too, this is the, the table, the very last page, kind of really breaks down every step. Now, um, there's, there's thought to this, right? There's a process in this, this plan. The Stantec group and, and others have, have done a lot of, of, of plans in the past, so they, they have a, a process that they like to follow. Um, you'll see in here there's some optional charges or optional costs that are highlighted in gray. Um, the, the kind of baseline budget is 168000 with the top end line with all the options to 191. And again, this is adding all the elements that um, we've discussed in the past. Really, you know, think about this if you, if you don't know much about downtown plans or really kind of some of these, these planning process. This really sets a, a vision, but also a work kind of framework uh, plan for the next five to 10, even longer number of years out. So we're really looking at a, a very uh, focused uh, community-based project and plan that really gathers that input for support. Uh, it's a partnership, obviously, between the downtown organization but the city. Um, so again, it looks at that long-term vision of how we do it. And Peggy's here to, if you, if you have any questions or want to see some example plans uh, or have any questions about their specific process, she'd be happy to, to kind of answer it. We've been working very closely with Peggy, or I've been working very closely with Peggy because we do feel that um, and Peggy's going to stand up here too. Thank you, Peggy. Um, we do feel as Downtown Moorhead Inc., this is a very important process for our future. Um, so there's a lot of things that Peggy and I have worked out where uh, myself as Downtown Moorhead Inc.'s you know, president and CEO that I'll be taking some of the lead on or, or be kind of tag teaming with uh, Peggy as the, the project lead as well. Um, so we kind of keep some costs down that way by, by board is paying me to to do a job with helping the revitalization of downtown and certainly that's just some of the duties that I'm going to have to perform as as uh, as downtown Moorhead Inc's lead. Um, there's also other things that we can kind of work out through this plan that kind of helps uh, share the costs a little bit. You know some of the things to highlight too is you know we've talked about the addition of adding the, the Woodlawn Point to the, the old power plant site as really gathering public opinion but also then developing a RFP for that so the city can take that, the EDA can take that, promote it, and try to get a really great project on it. So that is in this uh, this, this scope as well. Um, but really excited about this. This is fantastic. My board, just so uh, you're all well, because I know uh, John and, and Charlie uh, Pryor had asked some questions about uh, DMI's involvement. You know, my, my board, again, feels that my my cost, my time is a part of this as well, uh, but my board has agreed that um, we have a do not exceed of up to $30,000 at this point that my board has approved that we can financially contribute to the plan on top of some of the costs that it's going to take for, for me to be in that position that DMI is paying me for. Um, we obviously have a lot of different people in, involved in this plan, whether it's the, the universities, the, the school district, uh, a lot of different uh, avenues. Some of these um, uh, kind of listening and kind of community um, input sessions, certainly the EDA and the city is going to be a major factor of this. Um, when it's all said and done, we're really hoping that, you know, an EDA group, a city council, we're going to adopt this and we're going to do the work. We're going we're gonna to have some priorities to really put in place um, when we have development come in or when we have street projects that are coming up. Uh, these all guide our decisions moving forward. 
Uh, and we all know when you have the public support, it makes things a lot easier as well. So with that, um, Peggy, I don't know if you want to touch on anything um, or we're happy to answer questions or Michael and Dan, since you're part of the, the review process, if there's anything else that I've missed on that you want to hit. Um, we, we just think that this is a really unique opportunity, a really great team that's assembled. And, and oh, there's Dave Anderson right now that's just coming in. So uh, you know, we just feel that like this is a, a really good uh, scope. I, I will say too, and I've, I've said this uh, just to Chris Volkers before we started, you know, I, I've been a part of a couple of different plans now too, and one of them most recently was in Fargo, and I can tell you right now, based on the scope that's outlined in this process right here, um, and for the cost of, with everything, 191000 it is as much as what Fargo got for their downtown plan, and they paid 450000 So we are getting, I think, a really good deal, really great team. Um, that certainly DMI is, uh, is stepping to the table to really make sure we do this right and, and set ourselves up well for the future. So with that, I'll hand it over to, to Dave or Peggy or Michael, Dan. Anything you want to add, and then we can go into questions from there. Okay. Thank you, Derek. Uh, first, uh, I apologize for being late. Uh, the, the paying job was, was uh, keeping me busy uh, this morning, so I had to, had to break away from that. But um, whatever it is that Derek said, I pro I'm probably going to endorse. Um, uh, and, and I'll be careful with that. But, <laughs> but um, uh, a year or so ago, we selected leadership for DMI, and, and I can't tell you how thrilled we've been as an organization. Uh, having Derek on board, and, and I think I think you can all be be proud of his work as well. Um, and and what we're coming around to now on this downtown planning effort is the culmination of a lot of hard work by a lot of people over several years. Uh, you know, really the idea for the downtown group goes back five or six years now, when we really started to have a meaningful conversation. Um, now we've we've come really almost full circle with with that conversation to the point where we can get very serious about what it is that this where it where this downtown is going to be what it's going to look like what we're going to contain within it and and really where we can carry then this this downtown effort to to grow the economy here in, in Moorhead. Um, uh, we we particularly stayed away from the boilerplate agencies that are out there looking for these jobs. We made a very careful selection to find a group of people that were going to listen to us, that were going to meet with our community, that were going to have those meaningful interchanges with with the whole community of Moorhead and the people that call Moorhead home. Uh, it isn't it isn't it isn't going to be what you see in a lot of other towns with these with these plans that are just carbon copies. You know, we're, we're going to first pay attention to what it is that we have for assets, and then we're going to capitalize on those assets, and we're going to find new directions to go. Uh, and that takes hard work. And um, I think we have a great team to do that. Um, we have a community that's very responsive. Every time we have a public meeting and a public uh, gathering in this community, we get a great turnout because people care about this topic, and, and they want to see something happen. We've talked about it for so many years. Uh, you know, frankly, we. In so many respects, we removed our downtown 40 plus years ago, and it's time to to, to, to bring one back. So, that that that's all I think I really need to say. Uh, uh, we appreciate your time this morning, uh, considering considering this proposal. We think we've we think we're in the right place at the right time to do the right thing. So, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, just from my point of view and, and the history of involvement that I've had. It is. It's a truly exciting time to be at the point that we're at. And um, I'm looking forward to the results that uh, actually come from this. So I do have a question, Derek. Um, have you and Peggy had enough conversation to determine uh, if there's any monetary give and take um, based on the amount of time that you would be spending doing uh, tasks that relate to uh, what Stantec has proposed? I don't know if we've gotten into anything with like my specific cost to it yet. Um, I mean, we just kind of got here late last week just the, the full in-depth kind of scope of, of some of Stantec's kind of uh, billing. Um, but certainly there's a lot of things that we're kind of coordinating on. Some of the uh, interviews that we have with some of the business leaders uh, I'll be kind of being able to work through the city process of making sure they get the, the proper data, uh, 
you know, some of the public events I'll be able to kind of take a, a stronger lead on as well. Because when it's all said and done, I mean, you know, it's great to have a, a consultant group. You know, they're fantastic. They bring some expertise and some, you know, some pr relieve some pressures and trying to do it all as a, a, a single organization. But when it's all said and done, it's, you know, downtown Moorhead, Inc. It's the city that's really going to be the ones that are doing the work. Um, and so we're, we have a very strong investment in this as well because, um, yeah, like I said, when it's all said and done, we're going to be the ones getting out there and really promoting it and doing a lot of it. You know, a couple other things that I forgot to mention, too, is um, timeline of, of, the, of the plan itself. So typically these are, these are a lengthy process. They're about a year-long process, and that's really uh, due to a lot of the engagement that gets built up. You're, you're constantly going out to the public, um, trying to get that kind of framework, trying to get that, um, uh, building that kind of base uh, with trying to go out to the public because, again, we want the public to be involved. We want this to be a community vision, not just the city or downtown Moorhead Inc.'s vision. Uh, so we are looking at trying to kick this off in the beginning of May. And the reason why we pushed it back a little bit is just the unknown of the flooding. Um, there's, especially in the beginning, there's a lot of just in-depth kind of conversations that we need to have with city staff, download of information, you know, that kind of stuff. So to be respectful of that process, we're looking at the, uh, the start of May. Uh, and again, it would be about a, a year-long process. These phases that you'd see, they're kind of broken down, phase one, two, and three, and four. Uh, those are kind of the, the tailored kind of process. We'd have certain deliverables out of each one. But that's kind of the, again, the timeline of that it would kind of go through. Um, and Peggy, I don't know if you can kind of get into it. I think the first one, phase one, is about three months. Um, phase two is about six months. Um, and I, I'll let you go because I don't want to speak for it to you right now. But... That was our end. Um, each phase is about three months, uh, with the exception of the final phase, where we're really just kind of putting everything together and making a couple of really great-looking report products for you. That one's two months, so we do plan for about a year. Um, the way you kind of see these phases broken out, phase one's foundation building. Uh, that's where we work with Kilborn Group. Uh, we do a strong market analysis of the downtown. We look at all of the previous transportation planning, uh, strategic plans, infrastructure plans, all of the plans that, that have been done for the city that incorporate anything to do with the downtown at all. We kind of just build that foundation. Where are we at? Um, at the end of phases one and two is where we do a huge public engagement push, uh, where we have some of these optional items, but some of the base items within within the scope and fee that you're seeing on this spreadsheet. And we think it's important to to do these different methods of public engagement, do them in one, one large push. It kind of builds the momentum. And another reason why I think it's great that, uh, you know, we're kicking off the project here, start of May, getting everything worked out well, um, is then when we have that first huge push of public engagement, the colleges will be back in session and you'll see in phase one we have these eight listening sessions um, where we're going to work with Derek to kind of and 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 the whole team to really identify that's not just eight individuals it could be eight groups but this first phase the way Stantec does their these plans with our with our downtown plans and our urban plans is we do a lot of listening and we don't want this to be Stantec's plan at the end of the day. We want this to be the city of Moorhead's plan. So it's, it's so important to hear from the public. So doing that first phase of public engagement at the end of phase one when the colleges are back in session we think is really important. And we think even those listening sessions can be an opportunity where it's a great group um, to get multiple different agencies, uh, groups involved. But, but it's a good time to tie your public back in. Uh, phase two, plan framework. That's where we start to lay out kind of the framework and the structure of everything. Uh, we look at parking. We look at future land use. Uh, we look at uh, streetscaping and wayfinding. We look at transportation systems, uh, public and private development. So we kind of start to structure everything for all those different pieces, have another large public engagement push at the end of phase two, and then in phase three, we took everything we heard in the first two phases and we develop investment and redevelopment strategies. And kind of, I just brought a couple examples um, that our Stantex Urban Places Group is downtown. This is kind of a, just a full plan, you know, kind of typical, you know, you see thickness wise, you know, you can see it's, it's highly graphic, um, very easy, nice to look at. Um, 
goes through all the different, I mean, basically each of the tasks has a deliverable, so everything's very well documented within the plan. But most importantly, at the end of a lot of plans, you'll see what you have is like an implementation section. And so what we were really thinking with this is something like a, a playbook. And we, we've done this for quite a few of our plans now, but this one was for, for a project in Albany where we said, okay, really, let's take that really important implementation chapter out of the report and this is a playbook for the city for the next five to ten years and even some long-term strategies. And it lays out the implementation items, the, the development, the redevelopment strategies uh, for all things downtown Moorhead, breaks it out into a timeline, breaks it out into uh, funding strategies. So you'll see in phase three, uh, when we start to identify projects, we also start to identify funding strategies that go with that. Maybe that includes a timeline of when you might want to start submitting for some grant applications. But at the end of the day, I think you know, you'll have your full plan, but then that, that kind of, you know, implementation <coughs> section playbook is, is, I think, what will be the thing that Derek carries yep. under his arm every well, day. <laughs> and, and so much of it, too, is, you know, that, that kind of identifies the players, right? So certainly the city's going to have a, a stake in this. Downtown Moorhead, Inc. is, you know, I see Sherry back here, the Moorhead Business Association. There's, there's lots of different components um, where we're all kind of working together for the same thing. So that, that's a very important piece of it. Michael, I wanted to go back to your question that you directed to Derek. Um, we did sit down, Derek and I and Dave, was it three, three and a half hours last, yes. a week ago Friday? And we went through every uh, scoping item. And so if you actually get into the details of this document, we have areas where we say, you know, Derek's going to coordinate this meeting, he's going to schedule it, he's going to set it up. Um, we did add uh, some TAC meetings and some board presentations, uh, at least at the beginning of phases one, uh, two and three. We want to make sure that, that all the boards involved have, an, have the opportunity to see and bless everything between phases so we don't get to the end of the plan and not everybody's you know, on board, so to speak. So we added some of that, um, but then uh, you know, put in some coordination items for Eric, the optional pop-up events. We really reduced the cost on those. Um, because instead of having uh, multiple Stantec staff do it, basically Derek and I are going to go out together and do it. Pop-up event is just a really quick, fun way to do public involvement. And we said one of the ways, I actually put it in the scope, a uh, hot summer day, Derek and I are going to go set up in the Dairy Queen parking lot downtown. And it's just a great way to ask some fun survey questions and get public involvement without holding an official meeting and just going to where the public is. Absolutely. Sounds like a great idea. <laughs> Mr. Chairman? Yes. I have a, a comment and then a couple of questions. So first, I, I can't begin to tell you just how excited I am about this, and it's been a long time coming, and, I, and it's at a perfect time if we, you know, as we see the momentum building in downtown and to be able to build on that and have a really cohesive plan so that we can really capitalize on, on the good things that are already happening. And, and I was really excited to see us partnering with Kilbourne and Folkways and knowing the projects that they've done and some of the really creative things that, that they've brought to our community. Um, my two questions, the first one, so when I look at the southern border, um, I just was a little bit surprised. So on page eight, when you, when you laid out the southern border, and I think it's one of these it's always difficult when we have these conversations about what is downtown. Um, but I actually was a little surprised that you didn't come south onto 8th Street because, first of all, for consistency, even in terms of some of the zoning things that we've done, um, what is it, MU3 district that we created that stretches down 8th Street um, to 7th Avenue, uh, it is, you know, one of the things, and it, it also, it, it would um, also tie it in with the campus. And so if you think about, I think what people see as the beginning of downtown, that 7th Avenue um, where the gateways into Concordia and MSUM um, from there up really seems like to a lot of people, I think they feel like that's where downtown begins. And so if it were me, I would encourage you to add that in there. Yeah, and, and I can get into a little bit of the, the kind of the area and I will just say, and Dave and I talk about this all the time, and, and I get it, probably one of the first questions when I meet with people is, where the heck is downtown Moorhead? So it's not really defined in any way. What we did was uh, we took the, the new Renaissance Zone policy that was created, and we kind of used that boundary. Now, throughout that kind of process, we just felt that it, it extended too far to the east. Mm -hmm. 
I felt that, that where the new underpass is going is really a, a different environment. It's not your typical downtown development there. Certainly it's a, an entryway, but I don't think it's the same type of view. So we, that's why we lopped it off on the east end. I, I'm 100% with you that that college connection is, is crucial. We, we certainly can look at adding pieces of it. I, I want to be careful that we don't get too much into the neighborhood planning aspect of it either. Because um, there's certainly, there's, there, I mean, Comstock and others have, have a presence of what that should be. Um, so we want to be a little careful with that, but certainly we can look at kind of going down some of those STEM streets as well. Right, and that's where I would recommend following along with the zone. Currently we have the MU3 is the restricted to the half block on yeah. either mm -hmm. side of 8th Street going down to 7th, yeah. Yep. You'll find that I'm going to insist very much on that conversation, though, so that, so that we really talk about the possibilities as opposed to have a hard and fast idea of, of where we're going. If we already knew where we were going, this is a wasted conversation. Mm -hmm. We'll just make you a plan. You know, you can rubber stamp it and we'll go on down the road. That, we're going to talk about where downtown is and, and how the critical connections to our campuses have to be in this plan. Mm -hmm. You know, and if we don't talk about 8th Street, then we fail. So uh, there will be a lot of conversation about that. And my other question had to do with the listening sessions in phase one in terms of one recommendation I would make in terms of stakeholders. I noticed there's, while we're, we have lots of, there's lots of things in the plan about giz, getting input from residents, but nothing specifically about people who live in the downtown area. And I think that that would actually be really valuable. People who've already chosen to live in the downtown area because there's exciting things that they want to see in that in that area and so so i think that that might be a valuable one is to talk to some of those people many there's also several of them that are also, also local business owners i think of the junkies who are my neighbors that you know live and own a business in downtown moorhead and so um, i would encourage you to add them in as people who have specifically invested in terms of their um, purchasing homes and you know residing in the downtown area Oh, definitely, and we'll work with Derek to to make sure that you know when we identify who those eight groups are and stuff. To, we're covering that full gamut, and it's great because when you if you talk to those folks that are already living down here, you can say, well, "What do you need down here? What do you not already have down here? What do you desire?" And that kind of helps build into that market analysis as well. Thanks. I might ask just real quickly. Uh, you mentioned the number of stakeholders. So the question is with the variety of stakeholders, what role do you anticipate the EDA specifically playing through that process as you frame this plan? Well, I think that's something we can work through it too, but certainly I see the city and the EDA working very closely together. Certain policies would be examined. Um, redevelopment strategies, you know, we, we, we've, we've talked a little bit in the past, but there's a lot of new faces about just the role of the EDA moving forward too. Historically, right, the, the EDA and the reasons why a lot of EDAs are created in the state of Minnesota is to go out and kind of leverage land, right, go out and, and take on kind of the risk because the council is it's challenging and cumbersome to go through the council standpoint. So some of those strategies from the EDA I think are really important that we could, we could research and see what opportunities are out there. Um, but yeah, plan involvement, you know, I think all of us here have a, a stake in what our downtown should look like. So um, I see a huge value of inclusion of, of everyone at this table of, of how we guide that plan moving forward. So again, I, I think a lot of it we can still work out on what those specifics are, but a lot of it I think will come out through the, the planning process too. I was just going to add as well, if you look at the beginning of phase two and phase three, we had called out a DMI board meeting, but in talking uh, with Derek even just a little bit further this morning, um, you know, we'll, we'll basically we'll have a presentation prepared for that DMI board meeting. And I said, you know, we can meet with the committee of the whole, we can meet with other boards. It's, you know, I can come and just give you guys a quick, what we really want is we want all the boards to hear. At the beginning of phase two, we want you to hear this is everything that we gathered from phase one. This is what we heard from the public. And here's our draft vision and goals. And we want everybody's blessing on that because it's really important that we have everybody's blessing on that before we start the work in phase two. And then once we get through the done with the work in phase two, we have that huge public outreach push again. Then you'll see at the beginning of phase three, we have another board meeting, which is another touch point that we want to have. And like 
said Derek and I just talked this morning that that we should include as much of the boards as possible in those presentations because we really want everybody uh, to be on the same page as to where we're at before we start completing the, the next phase of work. And, and that's an important piece, Peggy. I mean, I think, again, we don't want to get too far along or we don't want, you know, Peggy and I and the kind of team just to start going and we don't feel like we have that comfort level or that check-in or, or direction, right, from from my board or from the EDA or, or have council support because, again, at the end, end of the day, we want this to be a, a plan that's bought in by everybody that we can implement. So uh, I think there's lots of importance for the EDA inclusion. Jeff, I appreciate your question a lot from maybe the, the the standpoint of being the old guy um, you know with a with a different perspective than just the next couple of years um, when I've done this before um, the ADA or in the case of Fargo the Renaissance Authority or whoever you know this was a marriage this was a long-term relationship that we were creating and uh, we don't have all the tools in place yet we haven't invented them yet uh, along the way, we're going to be coming back to folks like you and the city council and the city manager uh, because we'll have come up with something else, something new, some new tool, some, some new strategy that is born of this effort. And so uh, I would look beyond this funding request or this year of activity. I would look to the way that we're going to be looking to the future to be working with you and your successors in a, in a long-term relationship because that didn't happen over there in three years. You know, it's still happening. And it's happening in communities across the country that, that people like me and others were involved with over the last 40 and 50 years. Um, this, is, this is a new beginning and, and you never declare it finished. You never declare victory. You never cut a ribbon necessarily because it's what you did and you're gonna celebrate and then you're gonna pack up and go home. It, it, this is a long-term thing that we're going to be doing with, with you all and with your children and, and pressing forward to create something that is for the 7th and 8th graders that are in school right now. They're going to come into this downtown in a few years and own it. And they're going to think that it's the most wonderful new thing that could have ever happened. But it's only going to happen if we start this long-term relationship now. So you, your, your question is really right on because um, it, it isn't just what we need or want from you this year. It's what we need or want from you as we go forward. So thank you for the question. Derek, the, the funding mechanism for this, is this, you said 30000 from DMI, but this is yeah. EDA DMI? Sorry. I can you repeat that question, Pat? The, the, the funding for this, is, is this what, did, did we not approve 200000 for this? Is, was this already approved? Just at this point in time, in 2016, $60,000 was approved by the EDA at that point in time. Yep. I just, I just remember something from the past where I thought we approved. That was a discussion item at okay. one point. Okay, all right. And Chris can add to it. Yeah. Mr. Chair, EDA Board, thank you. Chris Volkers, I'm addressing you today on this item about the funding and the ask as your um, acting EDA, or exec, what am I, acting director. economic development director, acting economic di development director, not your city manager. And before I forget, this is Katie Birch sitting next to me. We should have introduced her at the beginning. She's sitting in for John Chockley as your attorney on this, um, for this committee today. Um, about the ask, Pat, thank you for asking. Um, and Derek's right. So the total that we think we, we need for this project to do what we think we've went through all the optional items is $190,000, okay? If DMI is willing to put in not only Derek's time, which is in addition to what we pay him for, for economic development services, and they're willing to put up to 30,000, that leaves 160,000. So my ask of you today is um, that we need 160,000 to close this loop and get going on this. 60,000 you already approved, um, Commissioner Kovash and, and Commissioner um, Burns, you're absolutely right. We've already talked about this a few times. We knew there would be a further ask. Here's the ask. We need an additional $100,000 to come from EDA reserves would be my proposal to you. There is about um, 1.2 something million dollars in EDA reserves. We absolutely have the funds. This is exactly what that money is intended for, to further the economic development in the city in and around the city of Moorhead. So I think it's very fair. So as your acting um, economic development director, I'm asking for that today. Thank you, Chris. Um, any discussion amongst the board here? Do we need a motion on the table? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, okay. 
Um, all right, we'll look. Uh, I look for a motion. Uh, anybody care to make one? I'll make a motion that we um, approve the one sixty thousand for this project. That would be a hundred thousand in addition to whatever. One hundred and sixty. Yeah, total. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Second. Now we can have some discussion. Chuck. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I like, you know, I, I love this. It's a blueprint for the future. Um, whole community involvement, the check in process. Um, what did Fargo pay for theirs? 450. Uh, music to and my ears. And they came in with another one on top of it, so. Yeah, that's music to my ears. I think this is, I, I think it originally was 60,000, but I think um, this is well worth it. It's a blueprint. It's, it's our future. It's our kids' future, like Dave said, so. Um, it's tremendous. This is a long ways from when I started five years ago, so thanks. Yeah. You know, if I could just make a quick point. You know, sometimes some of the costs that you'll see in these plans really come from the public engagement piece. So if you want to engage the public, that's where it's going to happen. So um, to credit to Stantec, which when we went through the reviews, I mean, they bring this local knowledge along with this national expertise that really brought a lot of excitement. Um, I, you know, couldn't help as we're sitting here having this conversation, a lot of the planning to plan has already been done, so we're there. I mean, there's been a lot that's gone to get us to this point. And, and then just in my own mind, I feel like we're getting a twofer. We've got this 70s era strip mall and a downtown project <laughs> kind of happening at once. So it's kind of like a double, a double redevelopment plan happening here. So. Yeah, and that's a, that's a good point. I, for the, I didn't touch on this, but you know, a, a big piece of this plan is uh, we do have the consent of the mall ownership group to study what this could become. Uh, and that's a big step moving forward because as Dan has mentioned in the past, is when we go to the public, there's not so much of like, what's the downtown plan, but it's like, what's the plan for the mall? So to be able to have that, that component of it, because when you really take this you know, mall footprint and you put it, you know, say Broadway and Fargo, I mean, it's, it's pretty much the same amount of space. Uh, I mean, there's, it's a big chunk of our downtown and, and how we kind of get public engagement of what this could become is a, a massive step forward of, of how we make some decisions. Any further comment? John. This is my second time around uh, with the EDA, uh, and this is the really first real significant proposal we've seen being presented to the EDA. We have million dollar plus in reserves, so my question is $100,000 sufficient because the downtown group said up to 30, so. Uh, and we have potential other things that the group could do. So I don't know if do you think you want to come back or do you want to increase the proposal for funding so there isn't any shortage in doing this project correctly. Uh, Peggy, do you anticipate any additional items that haven't been thought about or anticipated? Well, at this time, with the total being right around the 190, um, I think that the, this board has already approved 60, so with the additional 100 and 160 and then 30 from DMI, that gets us up to our, our total scope amount. Now, sometimes we can't always see into the future, but maybe once we hear from the public during phase one or even in phase two, if something comes up where working with Derek and, and Dave and others where the public says, we really want you to study this. If something came up where we said, this is an additional scoping item ask, at that point we could potentially come back and say, you know, but at this time this, this is what we feel that we need to complete this scope of work. I'll add as well too, so th there's a couple items on here, you'll notice like 1.14, 1.15, there's a walking and biking tour. So you know, Peggy and I had, had a lot of conversations like this summer, there's a lot of construction in our downtown. You know, is that something that we want to put the money to? So there's still some items that we could kind of collaborate on that it may reduce some of the cost. You know, same thing with some of the college campuses, like public engagement. I've already been talking with MSUM and Concordia with some of their student governments of them kind of hosting the event, but then we're kind of helping on the side. So I think there's ways that we could get there. I think the 190 is going to be sufficient for what we need. Um, Certainly, I mean, we're, we're willing as a board to kind of uh, put in that additional amount because we know it's going to be helpful for our future. Um, but I, I think we're, we're getting a good amount here. Yes. 
And the other thing to note is, you know, you, if you look at the actual paragraphs in the scoping where I say Derek's going to help organize this, invite these folks, I mean, that's also helping save on the cost, you know, when talking about comparing it to Fargo's because he is planning to put that time into it to help keep the cost down to do that and working together on that. Any other comment? Yes, Chuck, do you have something? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. All right, hearing no further conversation, uh, we should vote. Mm -hmm. All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried, great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, and, and we'll definitely be keeping you posted. There'll be more to come with it, so stay tuned, and we'll definitely keep everybody in touch. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, moving on, let's see. Uh, Makara Development Control Board meeting update. Yeah, I just want to give a quick update and thank you to, um, uh, to those uh, members on the, the EDA board that serve on the Makar Review Board. We, um, we had a uh, question come forward to us. There was a developer that was looking at um, a city-owned parcel in the Makara, Makara Industrial Park that the city owns. There was two city-owned properties. And um, there was a question of whether or not the city should be selling uh, those city owned lots to a, a non rail user on a rail spur lot uh, We've had some um, well, the majority of those users that are out there right now in the city of sold that either are using the line or they have the intent to use the line um, But there's some kind of caveats in there with specials for the the future rail improvements the maintenance of it Expansion of the the rail line if you kind of you know use up all those lots uh, so we brought together uh, the Makara Review. We also invited um, those businesses that are uh, touching the rail line right now. We had a full house. The whole boardroom was was packed. It was fantastic. Great turnout. I uh, had a really great discussion. Uh, and basically what that review board uh, decided at that point is that we should save those lots for rail users. Um, we feel that those are, the, the review board felt that those are prime lots. Um, some of the, the, the business owners that were there said that that was the reason why they came and chose to be at those is because they were on a rail line. Those are hard lots to find within our region. Um, so they felt that even though we, we haven't seen much traction with, with selling those, having those as an asset uh, is definitely something to, to hold on to and keep for our future. So just an update on that. Uh, those members on the review board, I don't know if you want to add anything else, but I thought it was a fantastic discussion, a really great turnout. So um, again, I'll pass it over to some of the review board members and then happy to answer any questions too. Yes. Uh, Derek, i just uh, wondering if you'd been able to get in touch with that uh, potential uh, buyer uh, and what kind of feedback they gotten after the decision. Yeah, I've reached out. Um, we haven't had a you know sit down meeting yet, but we've reached out and we're hoping to kind of have a conversation here soon. Um, I think he was well aware that that was probably the way it was going to go. It was more of an exp exploratory kind of ask, um, but we wanted to make sure we went through the diligence of, of getting some direction from that review board first. So uh, I intend to have a conversation here within the next you know probably few days. Uh, and we're certainly, like as we discussed in the review board, that uh, uh, even though you know the the rail lots may not be for sale for that particular use, we certainly have other lots in the industrial park and other lots across the city that uh, could be very usable for that developer. Yeah, I just want to ensure we don't lose a potential buyer absolutely to that decision. But overall, I think it was well thought out. Um. You know, one thing that I was wondering, I, I know they were interested in those particular lots because they were a little bit less money, less money. But my thought is because they're on the rail, you know, maybe they should be a little more money. Well, and I think we can look into that, certainly. Um, you know, I think that's something to consider. I, I know uh, our city assessors have actually been looking at kind of revamping that, that pricing policy anyways. They are priced significantly cheap, I think, in comparison to what you could find on the market. So I think we want to be, um, I mean, I guess that's something for the review board to kind of consider, but certainly we want to be aggressive. We want to see growth, but we want to have smart growth too. So um, whether that's looking at other parcels or, you know, for the, the rest of the board, 
these parcels are a little bit smaller than some of the other ones, so that was some of the reasons for the cost. So we've talked about maybe parceling out some smaller lots that are consistent in size that may make more sense for that type of growth that are on a, a non-rail line. And of course, I didn't mean pricing ourselves out of the market, but right. just because they're on the rail, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yep, you bet. Quick question, how do you control that long term? So obviously if the decision is we're not going to sell to non-rail users, how do you control as a city the resale of that property and what happens? Are you going to put covenants against the land? There already are significant covenants, but that is one that's not in the covenant. So uh, right now, if somebody were to purchase that lot as a rail user, they could then turn around, sell it to a non-rail user. So we don't have any uh, regulation on that. Um, something that we can look into the maintenance because I think if they're still um, part of that rail lot, I can't remember if they're still a, 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 a part of the rail assessment or the rail maintenance improvement. So I don't think they lose that, but that's something we can check into the covenants too to make sure. But that could be one kind of aspect that kind of controls a little bit if they know about it. I think people might agree to pay the rail assessment regardless of use. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's, yep. that's the way covenants are yeah. written. Yeah, yep. it's just, is there a forbidding of it, but okay. Thank there you. is not. And those covenants, Amy, do you, when were those put in place? It's been quite a, quite a long time. I think they've been along for, and they're, they're pretty detailed. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Any other comments? All right. Thank you. Moving on to the economic development report. Yeah, I'll be quick. I mean, I, I presented kind of the, the item here, but some of the stuff we've already kind of gone through. So, you know, the, the forestry lot, we did have that uh, unanimously approved at council. We did have the uh, Village Family Health Services, the Goldmark building that's being built uh, just north of the um, Azul Plaza, the Hornbachers in South Moorhead, that was approved unanimously. Um, we have uh, the corridor study that's underway. Uh, Lisa touched on the 11th Street underpass with some of the, the funding there in the governor's budget. Uh, we've had some, some open house items that uh, we've had significant turn on, turnout, which is just fantastic. Um, you know, one thing that uh, I'll note here, we've been talking about for a while about this business retention and expansion program. Uh, so this is kind of the second to the last item on the second page of your, your economic development report. I did join um, um, the EDC and I think Ryan's still here, he's in the back waving his hand. Ryan's with the, the EDC, he's um, their new business development uh, manager or director. Uh, so they're taking a, a stance of, again, they, they focus on primary sector businesses, uh, but when they're going out and speaking to specifically Moorhead primary sector businesses, they've been uh, fantastic in reaching out to myself. I'm able to uh, join them at their meetings. Um, they have a, a kind of really detailed process of some of the questions that they're looking to get from those businesses. Um, some, some some data points that they want to keep track of. Um, so really what it's intended to do is uh, say, for example, we went to, to Bytes, uh, Byte Speed in South Moorhead. You know, if they have plans to, to grow uh, or if they have uh, an expansion need, et cetera, or issues locally at the, the city level with maybe transportation, access, uh, state issues, those are all things that we kind of, you know, take take in. Um, and we go to work for them. So some of the stuff is things that the EDC can do, some of them are things I can do, uh, but having these consistent kind of check-in points with our businesses is a really big deal. Um, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of time, um, but it's something that we want to prioritize because uh, the more we can serve the businesses that are here, uh, the better off we are too. So uh, thankful to, to go on that visit. You'll probably see more of those in the future. Um, if you talk to different businesses in the community, feel free to have them reach out to me. Some of them can be as casual as a phone conversation. Some of them are actually going out to the site and touring it. So uh, keep us in mind while you're going out and talking to different, different folks as well. Okay. Any questions on the report? Thank you. Moving on. You look like you're getting ready to say something, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> The uh, item number 12, information update. Yeah, well, so what I, what I was really getting excited about is to lift up some of the work of our staff. Um, Kim Sotrowski um, in our planning department put together 
this 2018 development report, which is really pretty incredible. Um, you know, it speaks to some great development in residential, commercial, industrial uses, but then also to what's happening around neighborhood communication and support and some of our strategic priorities. And so it's just a, it's just a really neat document and um, really goes to show what a lot of um, really good and smart people working together um, can accomplish. I'm not talking about just from the staff perspective now, but I'm talking about the great work of the of councils and boards that are advisory in nature and people that live in the neighborhood and people and the folks that just decided to work together to get the great things done here. So but I read this, it just was it was something that filled my cup and I knew we were getting there. So Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is it your who who presents the budget? Oh the uh, quarterly budget report. Okay. This report is just, uh, um, Chris Fokers, um, this report is in a different format than you're used to seeing, so um, maybe what we should do is bring it back in a proper format so you can you, see what you approved and what the expenditures are and what the projections are, <laughs> because uh, the percentages are off a little bit. This was just printed from the the um, system we use is not very user friendly. Um, so there are some explanations that are warranted and um, I think we should bring it back in a format that you're used to. Yes, Amy. I could take a stab at just highlighting, um, although it is in a, a, an ugly format. Um, <laughs> if you look at the one, two, three, fourth column where it does say annual budget, that is exactly as approved um, in, the, in the EDA's budget. Um, each of each of those line items, although um, if you look at like different line items that are um, that are involved with the with employees, so para contributions and FICA contributions, those are all kind of broken down a little bit, you know, more in more detail. But um, where you're going to find kind of a, a little bit of a wonkiness is um, if you look under uh, where it says professional services under that line item where um, you see some really big numbers under the um, year-to-date encumbrances and whatnot. That is actually Derek's and, um, contract. So rather than showing it up on the very top line where we kind of all sort of intuitively would think that it would be, um, it's actually shown as a professional service. And so that will take a budget adjustment at the end of the year just to make that um, even balanced out, but other than that, everything is is basically as you approved it. So you know, in the in the year to date column, you can see exactly what was expended so far in a really ugly format. All right, thank you. Any other items to discuss? Hearing none, I guess the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.